Are y'all thirsty? Perhaps you might have noticed that I drink a lot of water. As many of you know, I spent the first 18 years of my life in southeast Texas, where the relentless heat and humidity makes a Massachusetts summer day look mild. In Texas, I was constantly aware of my thirst because I was constantly sweating from the moment I stepped outside of my cool, air-conditioned house in the morning, the moisture began to rise out of my skin, covering my body in the low-level stickiness. <clears throat> in Texas, it was easy to realize that I was thirsty because I could literally see the water leaving my body. Probably because of this, I was taught from an early age to always be drinking water. My mom, who was a homemaker at the time, constantly carried a large cup of ice water around the house with her wherever she went, almost like an appendage to her body. And in school, my classmates and I carried frozen bottles of water with us in our backpacks and then into our classrooms each morning. At 8 a.m., we each had a block of ice sitting on our desktops, but the ice would quickly melt and continue to do so throughout the day, providing a steady stream of cool, refreshing water until by the end of the day, all the ice had melted. Now, as a young adult, I traveled away from Texas. I traveled to Colorado to visit a, a close friend of mine. And I quickly learned that my need for water exists even if I can't see it or even feel it. As my friend and I road tripped from Denver up into the cool summer mountains for a weekend getaway, she insisted I continue drinking water, constantly reminding me. And then she dutifully pulled off at gas stations along the way so that we could each refill our water bottles. So I just continued to drink and drink and drink, rarely needing to use the bathroom because my body just lapped up every ounce of water. Because in that arid climate of the Southwest United States, the air is so dry that your sweat evaporates before you can even see it and realize that you're getting dehydrated. I don't think I sweated the entire time I was in Colorado, but I probably drank more water than I have in my entire life. My body just needed it. In Grand Canyon National Park, there are signs strategically placed along the trails that remind you to stop and drink water. Has anyone ever seen one of these signs in Grand Canyon National Park? Yeah, a couple of you. So the, the signs say, stop, drink water, you are thirsty, whether you realize it or not. Beloved, are you thirsty this morning, whether you realize it or not? According to a poll from Gallup released last month, only 38% of Americans say that they are satisfied with their life. And this number has been steadily declining over the past few years. In other words, three in five of us are unsatisfied with our lives. Despite our relative wealth, and our high levels of access to pleasures like food and drink, cars and clothes, entertainment and education, we are dissatisfied. We come to church on Sunday mornings, worn ragged from having spent the week chasing after all the things that the world tells us that we need to quench our thirst. Money, status, popularity, pleasure, outward appearance, and yet we're still thirsty, whether we realize it or not. <clears throat> Here's an example. Have you ever gotten what 
you felt like was everything you always wanted, only to realize that there was something else that you wanted, kind of like running on a never-ending hamster wheel. Maybe it was a promotion at work or a raise at work. Maybe home ownership. Maybe paying off your debt or losing a certain amount of weight. Maybe it was a marriage or a child. I remember a time in my life when I thought, if I can only find my husband, my one true love, then my life will be complete. Then I will be truly happy. And if you know my husband, you know he's pretty awesome. But if you know human behavior, you also know that I was wrong in my assumption that finding a husband would provide ultimate life fulfillment. Don't get me wrong. Getting the one thing that I wanted in this instance was one of the greatest blessings of my life. But it didn't fill that void that we all have inside of us. It only opened up the door for a new kind of hunger, a different kind of thirst, the next thing that I wanted. As human beings, we never stay satisfied for long. Assuming that you know what I'm talking about, our human predicament is not dissimilar from the situation that the writer of Isaiah 55 had in mind when he wrote these words. Ho! Which means, listen up! Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? And your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. And delight yourselves in rich food. Now these words were written thousands of years ago to a community of people who were living in exile. They had plenty of reasons to be thirsty. They too also had a history of dissatisfaction. It all started in the garden, didn't it? With a piece of fruit that failed to satisfy. Then there was slavery in Egypt, which they thought was their singular source of all their troubles. But when God saved them from slavery, the relief and happiness only lasted a couple days before they were dissatisfied again. Lost in the wilderness, they complained that they were hungry. So God rained down manna from heaven, this amazing miracle. But soon enough, they grumbled again, wanting different food, more variety in their food, dissatisfied with the provision that God had given them. And then finally, God delivered them from the wilderness, and they entered the promised land, and that wasn't enough either. It was never enough. And now, in Isaiah 55, they're in exile, thinking that if they could just go home, if they could just get back to the promised land, then they would be at peace. Then they would be satisfied. Then they would be free. But they're wrong. It won't be enough. It will never be enough. Because God's people have forgotten that the riches of this world will never truly satisfy. They have forgotten that their one true source of fulfillment is God. Does that sound familiar? It does to me. So God reminds them. God says, come to the water. Come to me. Incline your ear and listen to me. Excuse me, incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. God is reminding 
God's people. That true fulfillment and lasting satisfaction can only be found in God. Can only be found in relationship with God. Can only be found in keeping their end of the covenant relationship that they have formed with their God. How do we keep our end of the covenant relationship that we have with God? Verses 6 and 7 lay out what it looks like for God's people to honor our part in the covenant. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord that he may have mercy on them and to our God for he will abundantly pardon How do we keep up our end of the covenant relationship we have with God? Stay close to God. And then return home to God when we stray. This is what it means to be God's people. Both thousands of years ago and right now, today. Staying in the covenant relationship we have with God is the way to true satisfaction and lasting fulfillment. From time to time, someone who has attended one of our worship services will ask me, what's the big deal with the water? Totally understandably, they want to know why we make this big point of pouring water into our baptismal font each Sunday at church. And the answer, my answer, is that we need to be reminded of our source of ultimate fulfillment. The water is an outward, visual sign of our covenant that we have with God today, which tells us that as God's people, God has promised to love us no matter what. No matter if the church says if we're in or out, No matter if society tells us if we're worthy or unworthy, God says, I love you. I accept you. You are my beloved child. No strings attached. And as human beings, as God's people, our challenge is to constantly come home to that covenant relationship. To come home to God. Come home to love. The water reminds us of our baptism, which is the moment in our lives when we get incorporated into the covenant that God has made with God's people across time and space. We pour the water because we desperately need to be reminded that the love of God is our ultimate and lasting source of fulfillment and satisfaction. I have a spiritual practice in my life that I resort to at times when I'm really struggling and feel like it it seems like no matter what I try, I just can't make myself feel better. I remember my baptism. You can do this in your everyday life by washing your hands or washing your feet. You can do it at the lake or the beach or just at home in your bathtub or in your shower. You simply go to a source of water, let the water wash over you, and as it washes over you, you remember over and over and over again, as many times as it takes, that you are fundamentally loved and accepted by God, no matter what. And as you feel the water, you receive the message that it carries. You receive the truth that you are beloved, the good news of Jesus Christ. This is just one simple practice that you can use to return home to God. It's not a magic trick. It works well for me. 
It may or may not work well for you. It's clearly not going to solve all of your problems. But it's one avenue by which you can return home to God and return to our covenant relationship with our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer. To close, I want to share one more thing. When I was probably about the age that Esme is now, I went to my first swimming lesson. And at that swimming lesson, I learned the secret to floating in water. Does anybody know the secret to floating in water? Relaxing. Yeah. The secret to floating in water is relaxing. Trusting that the water will hold me if I let it. And so with my swimming instructor standing next to me, I laid back in the water and I tilted my face toward the sky and I spread out my arms and my legs and I floated. How cool. As human beings, that's the relationship we have with water. If we go to the water and we trust the water, the water will hold us. And it's similar with God. If we go to God and we receive God's love for us, God will be our ultimate source of satisfaction. Beloved, are you thirsty this morning? Amen.